I'm Allison Calder, and I am the chapter director here in Utah. Do you want to introduce yourself, Annette? I'm, in, I'm Annette Hale, and I'm the chapter director in Idaho. And we like to call ourselves the Intermountain Chapter because we like combining. Because Manette's like awesome at planning events and fun. Check out the Idaho Talent Fest if you haven't. And I'm the one who like loves education and research. And so we make this awesome team. That's what we've decided. So we are so happy to welcome you here. We feel really fortunate to be at a clinical trial research network site, the University of Utah. We're so thankful for you, for your support, for the researchers and all the supportive staff. And how great to have the National FSHD Society supporting us in this event. We have a lot of people who are tuning in virtually and a lot of you who have come out today so thank you so much for that oh, I would like to introduce Beth Johnston now a little bit of FSHD history so my husband was diagnosed back in 2013 he was 29 I think at the time so that's what pulled me in to FSH in general and we were living in Manhattan at the time and I heard about this like awesome power woman named Beth who had just like left Manhattan and moved to Colorado and that's kind of when I started getting involved in the FSHD Society. And Beth actually flew back to New York to plan this great event. And I just felt a great connection to Beth because her husband also has FSHD. And they both live FSHD kind of in denial because that's how they like to cope with it. And so we just really related in how we coped with the disease and how um, and what we do to move forward because we have so much hope. And we're so thankful for the FSHD Society, for all of you, and for researchers for supporting so Beth is a powerhouse, and she has helped make the FSHD Society what it is today. So we are so lucky to have her here in our region so she can support us in these events. Wow. How do you follow that? I mean, wow. <laughs> um, well, hello, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces and so many new ones. And if I don't know you, I want to know you before we leave here today. So thank you so much for joining us both in person and our virtual audience. Everyone turn around and wave at the camera. We've got a lot of people online visiting us today too. Um, so I'd also like to really, really thank the University of Utah team for hosting us today. This venue is amazing, um, all of your help. Um, and I will point all of you out later, all you people who have been helping us along the way. Um, but before we get started, um, I'd really like to thank our very generous sponsors of the FSHD 360 conference program, Avidity Biosciences. Um, please be sure to visit uh, both Amy and Teresa in the back of the room today. They have a table back there. Um, and also Perkin Elmer Genomics is also a sponsor of ours for these lovely, awesome educational conferences. Um, oopsie. For those of you who don't know us, the FSHD Society is the world's largest, this is a mouthful, so I got to say it right, world's largest research-focused patient advocacy organization that is focused solely on FSHD. We have over 30 volunteer-led chapters all across the U.S. and in Canada, and we're part of a 20-plus World FSHD Alliance. Um, our mission, as you can see, is to find treatments and a cure for FSHD while empowering you, our families. We host these and so many other educational and social events too, to give you, our families, an arsenal of knowledge um, so that you can be your own best advocate when it comes to your care and empower you to better understand the research that you're gonna hear so much about today and the role that you play in accelerating therapy development. So why are we here today? Allison kind of touched on it, at the University of Utah. Because the University of Utah is a member of the International FSHD Clinical Trial Research Network. That's CTRN for short. So if you hear um, us refer to CTRN, it stands for Clinical Trial Research Network. The CTRN is comprised of leading FSHD research centers in both North America and Europe. Um, and they adhere to uniform standards for training and for assessing patients and sharing data. The CTRN co-directors are actually Drs. Robbie Tawil, who's at the University of Rochester, and Jess Statland at the University of Kansas. Um, this FSHD CTRN infrastructure enables fundamental research to be done at scale and quicker. It attracts biopharmaceutical companies um, into the FSHD field where they weren't coming before, and it improves patient care by enforcing best practices and standards. 
But most importantly, in addition to being an academic research center with expertise on FSHD, CTRN sites are also care centers that specialize in FSHD patients. So by being here today, you're connecting with an outstanding care team that understands FSHD, world-leading researchers, and clinical studies and clinical trials of FSHD therapies. So thank you for having us today, University of Utah peeps. <laughs> The society's role in all of this, so um, we are here to advance the scientific understanding of FSHD through research, to support the clinical research success through meaningful partnerships with biopharmas that represent the patient voice and improve their participation, and engage, educate, and empower the community through our chapters, our walk and roles, FSHD university webinars, and these 360 conferences, as well as many, many online communities that we call our gathering place, which includes our wellness hour, our care partner group that are for partners that care for someone with FSH, our early onset parent group for the parents that care for children with FSH, women on wellness just for us girls, feeling fit with FSHD for people who want to learn how to keep themselves fit, even with the disease. And of course, our FSHD radio podcast with um, Tim Hollenbach. He's a superstar. If you guys have ever listened to his podcast, he's awesome. Um, so for our agenda today, we're first going to hear from Dr. Russ Butterfield on the FSHD disease and research overview. We'll get to hear from and ask questions of our experts today on physical therapy, neurology, diet, and nutrition. We'll take a quick 15 minute break. We'll jump right into some different aspects of genetic testing after our break. And then we'll take a 45 minute lunch break around 1230. And I think um, we'll, the lunches will be out there and then we can bring them in here and sit down. And then everyone online, you know, grab your lunch and then come back. Um, and then we're gonna have a couple of talks from the research team here for, at the University of Utah. Um, we'll have a great update on drug development and patient involvement in celebrating that process or in accelerating that process. I just want to celebrate before I accelerate. Um, and then we'll update you on the chapter program and you'll hear more from our Utah and Idaho chapter directors. And then we'll have some time to socialize at the end of the day around 3.15. So without further ado, let's get to it. I'd um, like to introduce Dr. Russ Butterfield from the University of Utah Departments of Pediatrics and Neurology. Go Russ. Yeah. Are you good here? Do you want this? Yeah. Okay. All right. And then I'm going to switch this to not present. All right. I found you have to see what like, right into the microphone. Can you hear me if I stand back here? Here. Can you hear me now? If I'm in the microphone, I'm kind of a low talker. So people who know me, he just turned it. It was a little high before. Oh, it was? Yeah. Oh, for the room. Room. okay. How's that in the back? Does it sound like I'm yelling in your face? Good. Okay. Well, thank you for coming out today to talk about FSHD. And um, I recognize many of you, but not all of you. So same as uh, Beth, hopefully get to know you guys and have a minute to talk. Um, and the whole team, thank you for pulling this all together for us. So uh, my talk is probably the most uh, flexible one where I could talk about whatever I want. Whenever I give a talk, I have to give this set of disclosures because I we do work here with clinical trials, right? So I do advice for these companies who do things. Um, just for fun, um, today is National Smart is Cool Day. So uh, you all get extra credit for coming here to learn and, and think about genetics. Also National Nut Day. I only learned that about an hour ago, so I did not bring nuts, but maybe we can find a way to get some. It's also National Color Day and International Stammering Awareness Day. And last cool fact, um, if you took all the DNA, we're gonna talk a lot about genetics, but this is the cool fact you can actually remember. If you took all the DNA in one of your cells and strung it out all in a line, it would be seven feet long, so. Just cool fact about genetics. If you don't think about anything else about the genetics we'll talk about, that's one cool fact. So, um, and as I was thinking about what to talk about, I, I, I wanted to talk about stuff maybe we don't talk about in clinic very much. Like 
how to understand the genetics of FSHD and just genetics in general so that when you hear these research talks and this you know, company develops a therapy, so you can try to fit it in a context because most of those therapies are going to center around genetic mechanisms. So we won't talk, at least for my talk, a ton about the clinical part, maybe just a little, but more of just like, what's a gene? What's DNA? What's a chromosome? So that you can just have a framework to understand these things as they're evolving. Um, and then I'll just show you some kind of interesting research stuff we're, we're doing here. So that, that's the goal. And this slide I put together a couple of years ago, so it's not even fully up to date, but just to give you a sense for what's happening with research in FSHD. So this is, if you go online to the, the major search engine we use called PubMed, if I wanna find a research article about something, um, and I just type in FSHD and count the number of articles per year on that subject, right? That's this dark blue. And you look back, here's 1930s, 20s, 1950 is the article on the Utah family. And then all of a sudden around the 1980s, we started to pick up some steam. And now we're seeing like this exponential growth in the number of papers talking about FSHD, right? And that kind of correlates with knowing the genetics. So that all kind of that inflection point where it started to turn higher is when we figured out that the FSHD gene is on chromosome four and it's kind of near the end. That's kind of where that started. And this is a similar plot in blue that talks about um, DUX4, which is the gene involved in um, FSHD. And you see that really take off like here in the mid, like first decade of the 2000s. And it's just like this exponential growth in the research that's going on at FSHD. So I wanna maybe just start with that, like, wow, there's a lot happening in FSHD. And it's really a, a thing that's accelerating that maybe wasn't always true. So, so now we're going to talk about genetics. Modern genetics start with this guy, Gregor Mendel. He was a, a monk in Austria, and he was a gardener, and he grew peas. And he noticed that some peas have purple flowers, and some peas have white flowers. And if you took a biology class in high school, you probably talked about Mendel's peas, and you drew these little diagrams where you got big A, little A, or I guess it's B here, big B, little B, and you try to follow the inheritance of those traits, right? So that's where kind of modern genetics starts. That's like in the 1860s. And his work was lost for a long time and came back 50 years later. And this is the other image. And I use this image. I don't know if you noticed on the first page. This is an image made by Rosalind Franklin at the University of Chicago. And um, two guys at a different university named Watson and Crick used that image, sort of stole that image um, to decipher the structure of DNA. That was in the early 1950s. So here's Rosalind Franklin. She gets full credit for uh, actually getting that image. And so it wasn't until the 1950s where we actually knew the structure of DNA and kind of how the sequence goes. And you remember, how does that fit in with FSHD? That's a couple years after that big pedigree on FSHD was published by Tyler and Stevens, right? So when they did all that work, we didn't even know like what DNA looked like. Um, so what does DNA look like? Um, so DNA, we're just gonna go hopefully really basic right here. So if you just got out of your college class in biology, you're gonna be bored for a minute, but DNA is the contents of the nucleus of a cell, right? And it's this really long molecule and of consisting of four different parts, A, C, T, and G, we call those nucleotides. And it's the sequence of those nucleotides that determine like the structure of a protein, sort of the blueprint for how to build a person. Um, um, and the DNA has to be copied. So every cell has the same copy of that full set of DNA, right? If it's a heart cell, if it's a stomach cell, if it's a liver cell, same DNA in every cell. But when it, when it copies, it, it makes mistakes. And sometimes we call those mistakes mutations. Sometimes we call them variation. And that's not a bad thing that mistakes happen. That's what makes us all a little different and lets us get better that we have some of that variation. Okay, so that's the first, that's the DNA. So the second part, DNA is packaged into chromosomes, just chunks of DNA, basically, right? There's 23 chromosomes. You have two copies of each one of those chromosomes. One came from each parent. So, and that's sort of the egg and the sperm, right? You remember all that stuff. Um, each one of those human chromosomes, if we take them all together, that, that genetic code, A, C, T, and G, it's about 3 billion bases or, or letters long. So that's, that's if we drag it out to seven feet long, it's 3 billion letters. So that's a lot, that's a lot of code there, right? Um, 
just speaking of chromosomes, uh, you might remember in biology class when you're a kid, like cutting a piece of onion and looking at it under a microscope, and you see these uh, little things here, like those are chromosomes, and they're in a cell that's dividing, right? Um, and at this, in the medical field, we, we kind of put these images together, and you can see little banding patterns in the chromosomes. You might be able to tell if a part's missing or not. And then we kind of draw them out in this, this sort of way. Um, the chromosomes have a short arm and a long arm so the p and you're get this comes up later for fshd so don't worry the short arm is p and the long arm is q and the bands are numbered and we can kind of tell a lot about those things but um what's in, next most important thing to know about chromosomes is that vision you have in your head of that little x-shaped thing that's not what chromosomes are like in a cell that's actually doing something right that's how it looks when the cell's dividing and the dna gets wound up really 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 tight so think of just taking a string or a wire and just wind it wind it wind it wind it and then it collapses on itself and keep winding 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 for a really really long time to compact it all up right because you take seven foot long molecules and you crap them up into this little tiny, tiny, tiny nucleus, right? And there's a structure um, around, around that, that winding that is important. And it's really important for FSHD as a genetic disease. It's not important for all genetic diseases, but I'll, and I'll show you a little bit how that is. But just remember that chromosomes have a structure and a sequence, okay? So what is a gene then? So a gene is that set of genetic code that's a blueprint for making protein. That's sort of maybe the simplest way to think about a definition for a gene. So each person has about 20,000 genes on those chromosomes. And uh, there's a lot of sequence in between the genes that isn't that well understood. And actually the, the FSHD sequence is in kind of one of those regions that's not very well understood. And a, and a genetic disease happens when we change that code, usually. Or maybe we just don't express that gene in a normal way. So, and the last little thing, and you'll hear more about genetics from uh, Kristen, who's here at the back, but just, uh, just so you'll remember, inheritance, we think of dominant diseases and recessive diseases, right? So in a dominant disease like FSHD, you only need one bad copy of that gene to have the disease. And so uh, each person who has the disease passes it to half of their offspring, um, and, and often there's a family history, like with FSHD, you know, your mother has it, your grandmother has it, et cetera. Um, and, but recessive diseases are different in that you need two bad copies of that gene to have the disease. And usually there's not like a family history because it, it's not very common that two people have a mutation in the gene, right? So, and so that's just sort of basics on the, the inheritance. Now, a little bit of history. So the Human Genome Project is a, is a really important project that started to unlock the door for doing a lot of the work that's happening now in genetics and then especially for FSHD and other genetic diseases. So this goes back to early discussions back as far as 1980s. And in fact, there was a really famous meeting up at Alta here in Utah where the sort of some of these things were hatched and, and Utah was a big part of that. But this is a big collaboration. They spent $3 billion and then published that first draft sequence in 2001. So we're a little bit more than 20 years after that very first so that that basically means we know every letter of that three billion letter code right that's the idea um and and the goals of that were so that we could identify the genes we'd know where they are and how many and i even remember as early as when i was in my phd program we didn't actually know the number of genes some people said sixty thousand or eighty thousand and actually we were kind of surprised that it was only twenty thousand um and know the sequence put it in a database and let people use it, talk about tools for analysis. So they've been really successful at all that stuff in the Human Genome Project, right? And so where does the University of Utah put in? I stole this picture and it might not be very easy to see, but there's some really important parts of the history of genetics that happened here at the University of Utah. One is this thing back to the 1950s that uh, investigators like Fayette Stevens were looking for families with genetic disease um, and his second family that he studied was the family with FSHD, but he studied lots of other things too. Um, and he just documented them. He said, what does their disease look like? What does their inheritance look like? What are the patients doing? Um, and he did that for a lot of different diseases. And you can kind of go through all this. Uh, you get down to Mark Capecchi winning the Nobel Prize back a few years ago, but you see this, uh, and I, I can't see it actually from here. 
um, the Alta meeting where we first started talking about genome and genomics and genome project. That all happened here. There's a little comment here about developing the markers so that we could do genetic mapping. That all happened here in the University of Utah. Um, Dr. Weiss, that you heard from, you'll be hearing from later, was a part of that early genome uh, work. So we, we go way back. This is just a list of genes. It's not even a full list of genes that were discovered using all those technologies uh, that developed in that sort of 1980s, 90s genome time here at the University of Utah. And it's a lot of them. It's breast cancer genes, colon cancer genes, epilepsy genes. All of these things were studied here at the University of Utah. And it's this guy who was the founder of all that. This is Fayette Stevens teaching a couple students. And you see in the background is the FSHD pedigree. It's his most interesting and most favorite pedigree that he made out of all those families that he sort of originated thinking about genetics and families with genetics. So all that. And so the breast cancer genes, he studied breast cancer families, the colon cancer genes, he studied colon cancer families. He was just all the way up to his eyeballs and, and as sort of the very first, uh, formally trained geneticists here in the state of Utah. And we had this collection of families that know their family history, that kind of stay here, have lots of kids. And so it just was a ripe for these new tools that were being developed. Okay, so this kind of gets us up to the early 2000s, right? So where were we like in the clinic with genetics at that time? So these were the tools we had. Um, chromosomes. And so you see this set of chromosomes here. This person's missing one of them. Um, and we could kind of look at the chromosome, see if there's a chunk missing or a whole chromosome missing or maybe an extra one. And that study was easy to do. And then we had a sequencing technology called Sanger sequencing, where we'd like run the sequence out on a really big long gel, right? And you would just read it from the bottom, A, C, T, G, blah, 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 blah. But that's actually kind of hard. Um, for FSHD, we had a really difficult tool called Southern Blot to try to diagnose FSHD. And we've actually tried to do Southern Blot, and we cannot figure out how to make it work. It's really, really hard. It, but if you were in the 1980s, it was kind of a standard procedure, right? Um, so we're just not old enough. If could, at, around this time, we got sort of a computerized way to do it, right? Um, so we could, instead of reading it off this gel, we use a computer and fluorescent tags. We're reading the sequence and it's a lot easier. You can tell just to read this, the code off of that than off of this. But that's kind of where we were for clinical genetics at the time. And then in the last 20 years, we've had this just revolution in genetic technology and sequencing capacity. So we have these things called microarrays and next generation sequencing. We had to do large genetic panels. And uh, our first clinical patient here in Utah that we did like, we just didn't know the gene for this patient who had a disease. And so we just like, why don't we just sequence all the genes? And so that was 2014 when we do that. So we're not even 10 years into that. And then we now have genetic therapies. So for Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, and SMA, we actually have therapies. And, and the data now, instead of looking like this, it looks like this. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros, right? It's all digital. Um, and, and, and genetic treatments for FSHD are coming, right? These things for Duchenne are already here and we're not that far away. So, and, and I'm not gonna belabor this, but we have these different tools now I use in clinic and I use them all the time. So exome sequencing, I just sequence all the genes, the parts that make protein. Um, disease panels, like if you come to the clinic now with the, like a muscle weakness and I think, oh, this might be some kind of muscular dystrophy, instead of like trying to figure it out for 15 years, I just send a genetic testing panel with 200 genes on it that are all muscle disease genes. And, and we know like three weeks later, the diagnosis, right? It's, it's way different. Except, um, and, or I just do all the, not just all the genes, but all the DNA. And, and we can do this in babies in the NICU now or any kid in the ICU in the hospital, I can just say, hey, can we just get a whole genome on that kid? And five days later, we have back the whole, their whole sequence and usually, or not usually, Sometimes we have a diagnosis. It turns out though, the FSHD, none of those technologies apply to, to, to detecting the FSHD mutation because it's just really hard. Um, so, so, and we'll get back to, I'm gonna talk about that. So, but at, at one more thing about genetics, it's not all in the sequence. And that's this, this whole field called epigenetics. So epi just means kind of on top of. And um, so I put this, remember how that chromosome is all wound up really tight? Um, there's a structure to how that winding happens. And here we're just showing um, these little kind of bluish balls 
um, called nucleosomes. And so I basically wrap the DNA around a couple of those, you package them together. And it turns out there's control signals on those that control the wrapping. Um, and so you see here, sort of maybe I can turn a gene on or turn it off by those signals that are on top of the sequence. Or this is a, the, the important one here. Um, there's a little tag on the sequence sometimes called methylation. And methylation is really important for FSHD. I'll show you how that works in a minute, but it's an epigenetic mechanism. Um, it's not directly coded to the sequence, but it helps turn the gene on or turn it off, right? And it's this whole new world of discovery now about epigenetics and how does epigenetics control a lot about how our genes work, right? And, and we could spend a whole career thinking about that. Now I'm going to tell you a secret that we've been keeping a secret for 20 years. Um, remember that that slide I showed you with the Genome Project finished in 2001, it turns out it wasn't actually finished. Um, it wasn't done yet. There was large chunks of the genome that we didn't have good sequence for. So what you see in this image, which comes from the paper that was published a few months ago, all the part, and this is chromosome one to 23. You notice that the longest chromosome is number one and this next longest, they, they were just numbered in order of size. Um, these red parts are parts we didn't actually know the sequence before when we said we had finished the whole genome. And that's a lot of sequence, right? You, you sort of take, maybe that's about 25% of it, maybe. And if you look on chromosome four, this is where the FSHD mutation is. Way out here on the end, there's a little red band out there in the area of FSHD that we didn't actually know about because it's really hard to sequence um, F, the, the region for FSHD. In fact, the authors who wrote those papers, um, and this just came out in March, so like less than a year ago, um, they made a whole big deal about the FSHD locus. So they said, wow, this new tool we have to, med to do long sequencing is a really good tool, and there's this interesting disease, and they made this whole figure, and I don't even understand it. I don't know, you guys just, it's just a pretty figure. Um, but, but the point is like that this, some of these regions of the DNA are you know, in the past, kind of thought to be just junk DNA. They're not exactly a gene. They're not exactly to just sequence that nobody knows what to do with. But it turns out they control a lot of the parts about that epigenetics and how the DNA is constructed. And, and FSHD is right in the middle of that. And now that this sequence is published, now I have a new tool that we can use to actually sequence this region and get a way better understanding in a way that we didn't have through all that other revolution in genetic technology over the last 20 years. So, so why is FSHD hard? Um, we're going to start with just a couple definitions. First, just remember, it's way on the end of chromosome 4, we call 4P, so the long arm of chromosome 4, and it's way down at the end. And every chromosome has a little tiny tip called the telomere, and that telomere has some repetitive sequence, and the very next thing in is the FSHD locus, right? So it's literally at the end of the chromosome. And there's a repeat sequence there called D4Z4. So this is another thing to stick in your head. D4Z4 is a repeat that's about 3,000 letters long, right? And we call that a macrosatellite. So on that tip of chromosome four, and most people have anywhere from like 11 to like 100 or more copies of that repeat. And so it's, it's just in one of these kind of repetitive, weird DNA, uh, DNA sequences that are out there in the genome. Uh, most people with FSHD have between one and 10. So, so that's the way FSHD happens. We make, instead of a lots and lots of repeats, we go less than 10. Um, but the problem is there's an almost identical spot on chromosome 10 at the very end of chromosome 10, and it's really hard to tell them apart. And so like any kind of sequencing technology we've had in the past, uh, it was really hard to tell them apart. So you can't just sequence something that's 3,000 bases long times 10. It's just, just really complicated, right? So that's, that's part one you need to know. D4Z4, it's just a big chunk of DNA that's repetitive. And then DUX4 is a gene, we'll call it a gene, inside the DUX4. Uh, inside the, sorry, the D4Z4. And DUX4 is a really interesting gene. Um, and I'll tell you about how it works in a second, but it, it doesn't really turn on it. So you have multiple copies of this gene, right? And every copy of DUX4 has a, of D4Z4 has a copy of DUX4. And, and it's a regulator of how other genes turn on and off, right? That's basically what that gene does. Um, and so FSHD genetics, as you think of it from a disease gene, it's kind of a combination of genetic, so the length of that D4Z4 repeat, and epigenetic, 
uh, factors. And the epigenetic factor is something called methylation. So I'm going to walk you through that. So um, whenever people draw the FSHD gene, they draw D4Z4 with a triangle, right? So you're going to see these like all over if you're ever looking at scientific talks about D4Z, about FSHD. So here's an example of a healthy person. He has uh, this triangle, which is D4Z4, and he has lots of copies. And then after that, he has this thing called 4QA that they're, and PAS. PAS is a little signal that lets you flip that gene on in there if, if the DNA was all unwound, right? And then it has this little black thing here. What, what that's calling is, if it's black, hypermethylated, and if it's yellow, hypomethylated. So what this, remember when I talked about epigenetics, we had that little tag called the methylation tag that helps turn genes on and off. In this region of DNA is like, the most dense number of those methylation tags in all the genome, pretty much, right? So there's lots of methylation tags. And they, if they have a lots of methylation, the DNA closes up really tight, right? So you can't make anything out of it, right? So, so tightly wound up, you couldn't like understand even what the sequence was inside that gene to try to make a copy of it, right? But if I take that methylation tag off, that DNA opens up big and wide. And now I can like, look at that gene and make a copy of it and turn it into a protein, right? So what happens in FSHD? So, so for this patient, normal, there's three parts, right? They have more than 10 copies. They have normal methylation, so lots of methylation. And then they have this thing we call 4QA, um, which means they have that little extra tag. To have FSHD, you have to have 4QA. 4QB is kind of a different... Uh, spot right there where that little pink box is uh, that's, that doesn't have that extra tag. So you can't, even if you had a short chromosome, you couldn't turn on the Dux4 gene. And so this patient does not turn on Dux4. And this patient has FSHD. And what happens in FSHD is that you turn Dux4 on when it's not supposed to be on, right? It's just like simple as that. I shouldn't have Dux4 turned on and now I'm making this gene and it's turning other genes on and off all over the place and causing problems. So in this patient with FSHD, you see kind of they have this, these methyl groups are now yellow. So the DNA is opening up and they have the A and they can turn on the Dux4. So they, and they have, because they have the 4QA. So that's the situation with FSHD1. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Um, so FSHD2 is much more rare, so maybe less than 5% of patients. But they have a, a similar problem. They have all three of these features, except for one. They don't have fewer than 10 copies of D4Z4. Um, but they do have low methylation, and they do have 4QA. And the reason they have low methylation is not because the smaller number of repeats. It's because they have a mutation in a different gene. And it's a gene that causes the methylation tag. And there's two or three of them that we know. One is called SMCHD1. That's the, the most common one. And one's called DMT3B. You don't have to remember that. It's just these other genes are sort of modifiers. So even if you don't have the full mutation by the number of copies, you can still get FSHD because of that other gene. Okay. Does that make any sense at all? I've been thinking about this for like a hundred years and I still don't understand it. It's just like, it's really hard genetics. <laughs> so, so as you think about it, you need those three parts, right? And it's just a big gene that's hard to do. So what does Dux4 do? Dux4's main function is in this thing called early genome activation. And this is just a picture I found to maybe explain how that works. Think of a sperm and an egg becomes a person right? And when that very first happens, the only genes there that are doing any actual work are the mom's genes that are in that egg cell. But pretty quick, you have to turn on other genes, right? And that's called early genome activation. So that's what this sort of graph is showing. First, we're using all the mom's genes. And then as we get some cell divisions and things, we're turning on the embryo genes. And that is just a flood of genes turning on, right? In very well-defined like series of things. And one of the very first things to turn on is Dux4. And so Dux4 turns on, and then it sets in motion a whole series of events that's going to help turn that little tiny embryo of like four cells into a human being, 
But pretty soon after just a few hours, Dux Force shuts off and it shuts off forever, right? It gets that methylation tag painted on there and it just winds down really tight. And there it is, Dux Force gone. And it's never supposed to turn on again. And so the problem in FSHD, so that's sort of represented up here in this sort of embryo cell, Dux4, everybody's happy, but now we've got it turned on in this muscle cell and it's causing problems because there's genes turned on that shouldn't just shouldn't be there, right? And there's a lot of complexity to the consequences of that. So this gives rise to some ideas about how do we treat FSHD, right? If the problem is that the gene turns on, why don't I just turn it off again? right? That should be pretty straightforward. And it turns out if I do this in a Petri dish, it's actually not that hard. I can just turn it off again. And we've got a group at the back here, Vidi. Um, their new drug and several other companies are working on drugs that do just that. Like, why don't we just turn that thing right back off again? Or what if there was another way to just turn that methylation back on? And so there's companies working on therapies that like, well, just put the methylation back on, wind that DNA back up so it turns off again. And there's lots of different ways to turn it off. Or um, what if, you know, that Dux4 turns on a bunch of things, right? And we know what those are. And one of those is a gene called P38. And so you, some of you know about the fulcrum study. Um, that drug is targeted at kind of shutting down everything from P38 on down. Right, so, so there's a lot of different ways to think about like, how do we treat this disease now because we understand the genetics better, right? Um, this is just kind of a reiteration of that that I just said. So now I'll get back to the Utah stuff, okay? You recognize this pedigree, hopefully. Some of you I don't recognize, you may or may not be a part of this family published in 1950 by Fayette Stevens. This is his kindred two with 1200 people on it. Um, and this is why here in Utah, we care about FSHD so much. So Fayette Stevens, the, whose picture I showed you, uh, started uh, collecting uh, this pedigree. And he was first introduced to a guy named Sam Baldwin, who was an orthopedic surgeon here um, in Utah. He came here in the late 1890s, I think. He was one of the founding members of like modern medicine in Utah. And, he, and uh, it turns out he was kind of only interested in muscular dystrophy, but he wasn't like a good academic. So he didn't publish papers. He didn't like, he's just kind of a good town doc. And so he handed all this off to Fayette Stevens and he published his paper and they did all this really good work. And, and you guys who, who, who live with FSHD don't need me to tell you about FSHD as disease, but this is a, a picture from that original paper. And you can see kind of the sloping shoulder and the overriding scapula and the thin upper arm muscles that are very typical of FSHD. And this paper, and if you want a copy of it, we have copies of this around, we can send them around, because um, I think it's kind of fun to have. Um, but this is kind of their summary of it. And they say it's this pattern of at progression, atrophy of face, pectoral or other muscles. Um, they call it benign um, because they're seeing a lot of other really worse things, but I don't know if it's that benign. And then they, they had a comment about the genetics, that it was a Mendelian, remember Mendel, um, a dominant pattern with complete penetrance. And that means you pass it to 50% of your people and everyone who has the gene has the disease. But remember, this is even before we knew about the structure of DNA or any of that stuff. But so they were really insightful in the way they thought about the genetics and thought about the inheritance and all those things. Um, and then they have this really interesting um, comment in part three. They were really interested in like, how can we figure out where this mutation is at? And I just thought it was an interesting, other disease and traits. So if you look at those old papers from Tyler and Stevens, they have blood groups on there. They were testing, there's a, I don't know if you ever did this in biology class in high school, there's a little piece of filter paper you can taste and some people taste it as bitter and others don't. So they were trying that out on them and they wanted to figure out does FSHD kind of co-segregate or co-inherit with any of those things. They were already thinking about genetic mapping in the 19th 1950s before they even knew the structure of DNA, which is kind of cool. Um, so this is the other really important finding from that study. And this is a thing that we're still thinking about even today. And, and this is just a quote from the paper. It's clear from the data in this kindred that severity in one in the parent had little to do with severity of the offspring. And they described examples where maybe the parent has a very severe version of FSHD and the child has a very mild version of FSHD. Um, and that, that's just a, just a part of FSHD, right? That variability. And, and we don't know why. And one of the things that we're really interested in as a research lab is 
what's controlling that variability. Maybe it's, you know, something you ate for breakfast. Maybe it's, uh, you, I don't know, you grew up on a farm or, uh, you know, who knows what the factors are, environmental, things like that. But one thing that we think is a really important factor is genetics. Is there some gene out there that's helping to control the severity between different individuals? And if we find those genes, then we can target therapies and, you know, we find those genes that are important in people who are really mild or really severe. We target those things to help develop treatments for this disease. And after 50 years, 70 years, whatever it is now, we still don't know the answer to that question. Why the variability in FSHD? So, and just to give you kind of a, a, a quick timeline, I might be, am I running too long? All right. Sorry, guys. Um, We'll catch up. So uh, you know this pedigree. It goes back to the the Parker family coming here to Utah in the 1840s and 50s. Flat Stevens picking them up. Um, the very first NIH grant to study anything outside of NIH was was given to study this family in FSHD. Um, so it's pretty cool. They followed them for a long time. Uh, we started collecting DNAs in the 1980s from Mark Lepper and his group. Um, and we still have those DNAs. So they're still here. At the same time, Stephen Jacobs and Dan Prairs, who founded this society, were also working with this family to help try to map the gene. And so they were collecting stuff. And then Kevin Flanagan had this publication a couple years ago, and we'll just kind of get through this. But we get all the way up through the end of this timeline, and we're just starting to get the tools we need to study this disease in a genetic way that has any precision. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes to show you um, one tool that's developed in our lab, and, and Dr. Weiss back here will tell you a little bit about us too, uh, using a, a, a tool called nanopore sequencing that we can now study this whole sequence um, in a, with some complexity, but we can now do it. And, and this uses a tool called nanopore sequencing. And so what nanopore is, is uh, basically take a, a flat membrane and stick a molecular pore in it, and we just stuff a piece of sequence through it. And as it's going through that pore, it makes a little electrical signal change, and we can tell which letter is going through the pore, right? And that's kind of what you're seeing on the screen here. That whole thing can be, this is a chip that we use for nanopore sequencing. You can do it on a little device the size of a flash drive, basically. So I take a sample of DNA, I put it in a little hole right here. That membrane is right here. It has 2,000 pores on it. And we can just sit there and we can just string DNA through it all day long and measure that. And instead of making a sequence that's 150 or 200 letters long, we can now measure a sequence that's 30 or 40,000 letters long, right? Because we don't have to fragment it up. And that means since the FSHD, you know, for, for a patient with six repeats of D4Z4, I can sequence across the whole thing now in one strand of molecule, right? So I'm just gonna show you a couple of slides that show how we did that. It's kind of hard to do. We had to figure out a way to cut the DNA in the right spot and only feed through the parts that we want. Else we'd be sequencing all the DNA, right? And it just, we never get enough copies of the thing we want. So we, we've figured, and this is all work that Dr. Weiss has done over the last year. And the FSHD Society funded a little project for us to do this work, right? And this is just some of the technical part. But now for a, for a genetic test to identify FSHD patients, remember those three things we need? Number of repeats, A or B chromosome, that, that extra tag or the methylation. We can measure all those things in one, in one assay on this chip. And then not only that, we can measure the sequence, like the actual sequence, letter by letter by letter, and we know all the methylation on it. And this is just a sort of example of that methylation. Methylation is just this extra carbon compared to this one that doesn't have the carbon. We did a little control experiment. So what you're gonna see in the next slide is it's blue if there's no carbon there, it's red if there is a carbon there. And as it goes through that pore, the deflection of that signal is just a slightly different, right? And so this is actual data. Um, so this is a person with six repeats. Um, and you see in blue where there's no methylation, or sorry, where there is methylation, red where there's methylation. Um, um, and you see kind of a pattern here. You can almost count the number of repeats, right? This is one with three repeats. This is one with nine repeats. So we can actually see, and that's and each row of this, it's kind of zoomed out so you can't tell, but each row of this is one strand of DNA that we sequenced. 
right? And so here, here we see 40 copies, 40 times we measured that now. And now we have a tool, and this is just a way to quantify that sequence, that methylation tag, right? So now we can start using a research way, like maybe a person with more severe disease has more or different methylation, or maybe those methylation changes are here in this part of the gene, this is where the Dux4 is, or here on that green part, which we call an insulator. And we can actually see structure within the methylation now that we could never see before. And so this is all new stuff in the last year. And this is a pedigree that some of you might recognize and members of the Utah family were a part of here. You see, I think we talked to you guys earlier. Um, and, and Dr. Flanagan did a study back in the day that showed every member of this family has the exact same six repeat unit. Uh, and that's a Southern bot and it's kind of hard to do. So now here's sort of an updated version of that with different family members, except the one with the stars, the same guy. Um, and you can see their methylation. So here in dark red, it's methylated. You can see those same patterns. You can see how stable it is across generations. And now we can start to use that in a research tool to, to measure the methylation level, how it controls or adapts to severity. So that's kind of all I want to show you about that. Um, and it gets back to this question, why is it more severe in one person than the next? And now we have this brand new tool that we can use that we just never had access to ever before. And it's because you guys have been engaged with us for many years. And in fact, we can look at an old DNA that was collected in 1980 and look at another one from the same person collected 30 years later and say, did the methylation change as their disease got worse, for example? So we have all that capacity because of involvement of people in research here for so many years. So, and that work was done by a lot of good people. Bob Weiss is a geneticist, and you'll hear from him later about some things who figured out how to do this. And Bob's been going back way to the human genome and been involved across the whole thing. And, uh, the, and the society and everyone helped us to do this. We got to give a shout out to this person who drew the pedigree that we met at the, at the Roots Tech a couple of years ago too, but I'm late. So I'm going to let uh, you guys turn it over to the next one. Please, um, be involved with our research. We need you to, to do these things. So, all right, guys.